Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I would like to welcome you to the 25th lecture of the Summer 2020 offering of ECE 3084 Signals and Systems. Over the course of doing these 25 lectures, I've become fairly sick of the sound of my voice, and I'm guessing you have as well, but let's just keep muddling on. So we've been focusing on frequency domain representations of signals. We started by reviewing the idea of Fourier series, and I'm drawing here once again our typical example of a square wave going between 0 and 1. Here I'm using T sub P instead of T sub naught, as we usually have previously, because I want to contrast with the T sub S that we used in the sampling lecture. So we'll use this trusty example one more time. Remember, we found the Fourier series coefficients of this to be sine k pi over 2 divided by k pi. Similarly, we've looked at Fourier transforms, which give us the ability to deal with non-periodic signals, such as a boxcar that is of length L, going from minus L over 2 to L over 2. And we found that the Fourier transform of this looked like sine L omega over 2, divided by omega over 2. Now you might notice I have sine stuff over some stuff, I have sine some other stuff over some stuff, and you might be thinking to yourself, is this a coincidence? And of course, unsurprisingly, it's not a coincidence. So let's explore this idea. Basically in this lecture, what we're going to see is that if we have a periodic signal that we could write as a copy of some sort of core element, some sort of core wave, something like this, and we have the Fourier transform of what that core element is, we can use that to easily find what the Fourier series coefficients are. So later in the lecture, we'll go back and plug in these specific cases to our results, but right now I'd like to think about it more generically. So imagine I have a function, xp of t, that consists of some core element, x1 of t, that we're going to replicate in time by multiplying it by an impulse train PT. This impulse train PT is going to be a sum of impulse functions that are spaced by capital TP. So when we look at what this function actually looks like, well, you should at this point have a feeling of what's happening. Convolution is a linear time invariant operation, so I can pull that convolution of the x1 of t through the summation and what happens when I convolve something with a delta function? Well, it gives me a shift. So what I wind up with is a sum of a bunch of these core functions that are placed t sub p apart. So for example, if x1 of t looks like a boxcar going from minus t p over 4 to t sub p over 4, and I were to take it and convolve it with this purple impulse train, that would wind up giving me this square wave. Now that's just one particular example. What I would like to do is get a feeling for what this operation looks like in the frequency domain. All right, so we actually computed the Fourier transform of little pt in the previous lecture on sampling. Let's just pull out that result. We found out that an impulse train intriguingly transforms into another impulse train, where all of the impulses have the same weight 2 pi over tp, and these impulses are spaced in the frequency domain by 2 pi over tp. So what does my periodicized, is that a word, periodicized signal look like in the frequency domain? So I'll have the Fourier transform of my core function, big X sub 1, and since I'm convolving in the time domain, I'll be multiplying in the frequency domain. So that's multiplied by big P j omega. So what does this look like? I'll have this giant sum over k, the 2 pi over t sub p can be pulled inside, the big X sub 1 j omega can be pulled inside, and when I do that, I'll use the simplification trick. Since this delta function only turns on at these points, I can substitute in for omega 2 pi over t p k, and then I'm left with the delta function still sitting out here. So basically, I have this Fourier transform big X of 1, whatever it is, but most of it will have gotten zeroed out. And the places that haven't been zeroed out are delta functions, where those delta functions have this weight of 
the original Fourier transform x1 at those points, times this 2 pi over t sub p. So essentially, I've taken the Fourier transform and produced a sampled version of it with these weird delta functions, much like the weird Dirac delta sampled time signal that we looked at in the last lecture. So once again, we see this symmetry between the time domain and the frequency domain. So we have this kind of symmetry in Fourier transform pairs, like boxcars transforming into sinks and sinks into boxcars. And we also have symmetry and properties, such as shifts in one domain turning into multiplication by complex exponentials in another domain, and vice versa. Here we see that same kind of symmetry between this lecture and the last lecture. Sampling a signal in time resulted in replication in the frequency domain. Here we see that replication in the time domain results in sampling in the frequency domain. So let's go back to lecture 22 and remember the Fourier transform pair we derived there. We said that if we had a periodic signal with Fourier series coefficients a sub k, here I'm going to write the complex exponential as e to the j 2 pi over tp, again using that instead of t naught to contrast with the capital T sub s we were using in the last lecture. We determined that this Fourier transformed into another sum of delta functions with the weights 2 pi ak delta omega minus 2 pi over tpk. But now if I look at this expression here from lecture 22 and I compare it with this expression here, we can see that they are very, very similar. We have the delta functions that are the same. We have this giant sum. We have a 2 pi here and a 2 pi here. So I can actually take this Fourier transform, big X sub 1, divide it by TP, and that's equal to this AK. So this is the thing that provides me the link between the Fourier transform of this core function here and the Fourier series coefficients of its corresponding replicated version. So let me go ahead and write that in a more official looking way. All right, ak equal 1 over t sub p big X1 j 2 pi over tp times k. If you're trying to find Fourier series coefficients of some weird waveform and it looks very painful, well, if you don't have the Fourier transform of the core that you could replicate to form that periodic signal, then this probably isn't going to help you very much. Computing the Fourier transform of that core is probably going to be no more or less difficult than finding the Fourier series coefficients using the Fourier series analysis integral. But if you happen to have this transform of this core function sitting in a Fourier transform table somewhere, this can save you a lot of time. So let's do a particular example where we're going to take this x that we have up here and plug that in for our x1. So to get this to match up, let me take L and for our particular example, let L equal tp over 2. Because if I let L equal tp over 2, I'll divide by 2 again. That will give me a tp over 4 in this particular slot. So I can wind up matching things up here. So if I make that substitution in this particular example, this particular formula here is going to have tp over 4. So I'll write 1 over tp sine tp over 4 omega all over omega over 2. And now I need to evaluate this at 2 pi over tp times k. So I'll have 1 over tp out in front sine tp over 4 times 2 pi k over tp. And then in the denominator here, I'll have 2 pi over tp times k divided by 2. The tps here cancel, the tps here cancel, the 2s here cancel, and then 2 divided by 4 is going to give me a half. So I'll wind up with sine pi k over 2 divided by pi k. And if I'm really lucky, that will match the Fourier series coefficients I wrote at the start of the lecture. And lo and behold, they match. Notice how tightly this locks with the sampling and time lecture we just did.
Sampling in time gave us replication in frequency. Replication in time gives us sampling in frequency. So oddly, the sampling story, which feels like a very modern story, is really the same story as the Fourier series story. And a mathematician might consider these kind of to be the same thing. But as engineers, we experience taking a signal and sampling it in time and thinking about the Fourier series of periodic signals as very different things. But they are really the same story. And if this class and EC 2026 don't make you run screaming from learning more about digital signal processing, at Georgia Tech we do have ECE 4270, which is our senior DSP class. And there, when we talk about discrete Fourier transforms and discrete time Fourier transforms, all of these concepts continue to play a big role. So let's take a time out and try to graph what's going on here. So let's draw what this sync type function looks like on an omega axis. Where are the zero crossings going to be? Let's see, the zero crossings are going to occur where we have some integer multiple of pi. Here I'm using L instead of K since we have already used K. So there's a zero at four pi L divided by TP. So I've got four pi over TP. We have an eight pi over tp will have a 12 pi over tp and so on. Okay, so those are where the zero crossings are. So if I were to plot out the function, looks a little something like this. So what is the maximum of the sync function going to be here at the main lobe? I could use the L'Hopital's rule trick and wind up with tp divided by 2. But if the function I'm actually plotting and evaluating things at includes this 1 over tp, then I get 1 half. And okay, well that's a0. That makes sense. That's what we get for our square wave. So that's the sample that we would get here if I multiplied it by the impulse train. Well, what about the other places where we are evaluating this at? We're looking at multiples of 2 pi. So there's going to be 1 here. And then there's going to be a zero, and there's going to be one here, and so on. And then if I take a look at this, I get the pattern that we previously plotted for these kinds of functions. There is this link between the sync function, which is the Fourier transform of that original box car, and the Fourier series coefficients of the square wave. And you can get those coefficients basically by sampling this frequency domain function and normalizing appropriately by this 1 over tp. So this business about something having a periodic structure resulting in a sampling pattern in its frequency domain representation actually goes back over a century. We've mostly been looking at signals in time, but many of the ideas we've been talking about can also apply to signals in space. Suppose you wanted to find out how a particular protein was shaped. If you pass x-rays through that protein and use a photographic plate, or nowadays it would probably be some sort of electronic detector that picks up those x-rays, you'll get a diffraction pattern. And if you make some mathematical approximations to that diffraction process, you can wind up with equations that look a lot like a Fourier transform after you do a few approximations. So we've mostly been looking at Fourier transforms as a way of interpreting signals and as a way of understanding how systems operate upon them. But there are some physical systems in the real world that, in fact, take Fourier transforms. That's their operation. And in fact, for things like synthetic aperture radar, Fourier transforms produced optically long before computers were powerful enough to take those kinds of Fourier transforms for us. Now, I've simplified a lot of things here because I've drawn this as a two-dimensional thing but this is really a three-dimensional structure. So there's some complications here, but here's the basic idea. If you take this here two-dimensional, or in general, it's going to be three-dimensional in real life, Fourier transform and invert it, you can get something of a picture of the shape of this protein. But there's a couple of problems. One is that a single protein by itself is not going to diffract strong enough x-rays to be picked up by your detector. And if you have a bunch of molecules of the protein, they'll just kind of be sitting around at all of these different willy-nilly angles, and your transform here is going to be all sorts of crazy blurred out. 
But what if we crystallize the protein? Then we know that each instance of this protein is following a particular pattern. Pretend these are all the same. Now, of course, in real life, there may be some variations from crystal to crystal, but this will be good enough. Now, if we pass the rays through the protein, something interesting happens. This is now a periodic structure. So what we wind up seeing on our photographic plate isn't the Fourier transform that you'll get from just a single protein. It'll actually be a bunch of dots. And these dots represent samples of this for a transform that you would get from just one protein. And now you have something that will pick up on the plate because basically the periodic structure winds up focusing a lot of the energy on these individual dots. So this goes back to the 1910s. And some decades later, looking at these patterns was instrumental in discovering the double helix pattern of DNA. So Fourier theory has all kinds of applications beyond signal processing, as we've been thinking about it here. Most EE departments will even have an entire class called Fourier optics, because the underlying equations that govern the behavior of a lot of optical systems, after you make a series of approximations, do look like Fourier transforms.